Well, for f- episode 53, I've got another very recognisable guest for those in the UK motorsport scene, because not only did this lady start racing back in 2004, would you believe it, at the Texaco Havoline Ginetta Championship and the Ginetta G20, but has also got on to be very prevalent in the legal aspect, not just uh, of being a solicitor, but also in terms of motorsport. And I'm really pleased to welcome along for episode 53, Happy Burns Night, Sarah Franklin. Good to see you. <laughs> now, has Ben your Daxon been trying to get at your whiskey uh, before we before we started recording? I've, I've left them downstairs, so they're not going to get anywhere near my whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but how how are things? Good to see you. It's been a while since we we last caught up in person. But uh, just just for the benefit of the the viewers and also the listeners, just uh, give a brief introduction about yourself, please. Yes, as you said, I, I started racing myself in two thousand and four. No karting background, or anything like that. I came to it quite late. Um, it's never too late to, to do it if you want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was a lawyer before that. I was I've done all sorts of different types of law. And people got to know within the motorsport industry that I was a lawyer. So I started being asked to do a few bits and pieces. Um, And then about, I think it must be about six or seven years ago, probably a little bit more. um, I started doing all of the tribunal work for Motorsport UK. So if you were naughty and you were dragged up before the National Court, I (laughs) I dealt with that. And then uh, about four years ago, uh, because acting on behalf of Motorsport UK, I was having to turn other people away because of a conflict of interest, so I couldn't deal with yep. teams and drivers. And um, so, yes, yeah, so four, about four or five years ago, I created Motorsport Legal, which was me actually helping teams and drivers. And so pretty much since then, I've just been doing more and more motorsport work. I do still have a practice that does sort of family wills, probate, that sort of thing, but that's all done by other people, and I do the, the motorsport work now. Yeah, of course, uh, Sarah Franklin solicitors based in both Kettering and Northamptonshire and Melton Mowbray, the home of the pork pie, if you folks didn't already know by your mm-hmm. UK geography. But also, um, you know, first things first, I want to talk about the, the British Motorsports Marshals Club because you are a club ambassador and you did also get the opportunity to do a day's training with our uh, our fantastic men and women in orange. Um, from a marshalling perspective, first of all, it's quite interesting to see how much hard work because it goes into it because all of them love motorsport like us a lot, but they do it for the love of the sport. They're volunteers. They really don't get any uh, sort of like recompense for doing so, but they get to see all the great events that we see. And without them, we wouldn't be able to go racing every single weekend. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I've been a big supporter of, of Marshalls from the beginning because, as you say, we couldn't do this without them. And I think um, I went along and did the, the training day um, up north and found out I was a bit of a pyromaniac as well, which is a completely different <laughs> together. But I honestly do think that every driver should do that so they can appreciate what the Marshalls train, what they do. And the fact that then you just have that bit of extra recognition for them so that if you are at a circuit and they're wandering around, you know, we all know when we're at the beginning of a day, you might see the marshals walking up, say hi to them, get, say, come and have a look at the car, come and have a chat. You know, that's what they're there for. They're there because they want, they love the sport and they like to be close to it. So um, interact with them a bit more and, and just, you know, show them some appreciation. They don't get anywhere close to what they should do. I mean, you know, sometimes they get, uh, vouchers for lunch um sometimes they don't get enough to even cover a decent lunch so um yeah they they are absolutely essential we would not be doing this um without them so they need a bit of re- more and more recognition and more and more people should do it and i absolutely think every driver should go and do the training yeah i think at one point i might have to give the bmmc a, a, a bit of a, a nudge and say look i might come along uh, because from from a commentator's perspective, one of the things that I always do, and I always make sure it doesn't matter which circuit I'm at, I always thank the marshalling crew because they work so hard because there's so many different aspects to it. So if you do want to get involved, uh, I am going to put a link in the description down below for the British Motorsport Marshals Club. Uh, so if you do want to become a, a man or woman in orange and be one of our many fantastic circuits around here in the United Kingdom, you can click in the link below and get yourself signed up for a training day and maybe get your qualifications. And some of my good friends like Trin, 
Trin Kershaw and, and Mark Hutton, who live actually literally a stone's throw. They live in Bagoth just off of Donny. Uh, known them for so many years, and they're great people. And I've got to know them very, very well. And in the fact that I've actually ended up going up there for like New Year's Eve, like I did last year. Uh, so it's always good to know that get yourself involved, talk to them, as Sarah said. Um, but let's get on to the legalities of, uh, of, of what you do with Motorsport Legal at Sarah Franklin Solicitors. You know, you've advised and represented clients in the FIA International Court of Appeal, of course, reference a recent case with the International GT Open run by the GT Sport organization over in Spain, uh, which saw a championship decision being becoming official. But you also deal with a lot of other aspects, such as appeals and protests, national, international court matters, even as far as the very big intricacies of, of driver driver and team contracts. There's a lot that goes on in motorsport that I think that when people say, oh yeah, like we've just seen today that Charles Leclerc has extended his deal with Scuderia Ferrari to go into the 2026 era of Formula One. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of get out clauses and, and things. How much attention to detail is there from your perspective doing motorsport legal? Because I'm sure there's a lot of early mornings, late nights sometimes when you're having to go through and get a deadline sorted. Yeah, and, and the year almost splits into two in, in some respects. So when we're off season, most of the focus is on contract work. So sponsorship agreements, driver agreements, team agreements, transport agreements, whatever it may be, um, sort of putting something in place for the coming year. And it is essential while things are nice and everybody's happy and they know know what's what to get it in writing and make sure that it's clear. So uh, I, unfortunately, still motorsport is still one of those where there's an awful lot of things done on a handshake. Mm -hmm. um, and then it gets to me when it all goes wrong and it's like, well, what, what's the basis of this contract here? Oh, well, he said he'd do this. And well, no, he said he'd do this. And you know, it just makes it so much easier from the very beginning to have a contract. So that's what I tend to spend a lot of the time doing off season. Um, and then the, the the protests, the appeals, the court work, the national court work and the international court work um, is tends to be during the season because obviously that normally is a result of something that's happened on track at, at a weekend. Um, I, more and more recently, I've been doing on-call work, which means that uh, drivers and teams pay me to be on call for the weekend, either at the circuit or um away from the circuit and uh, a lot of people you know will say well why do you need a lawyer to be to be present surely that means you're trying to cheat it's not it's about knowing what the regulations are and and you and i know that, that a decision can be made on a championship by one point mm -hmm. and so if you let somebody get away with something that they shouldn't be doing and yeah. because people don't know what the regulations are or you get unjustly penalized and you accept it because you don't know what the regulations are then you know, that can be the difference between winning, winning a championship and not. So having somebody like me who understands obviously the general regulations, the, the blue book, and um, that understands the regulations for the championship as well, means they don't have to worry about it. So um, I do a lot of that. And then obviously if there is any penalties that ultimately end up going to the national court, then we carry on and, and represent them beyond that. So, you know, you have sort of like the contentious and the non-contentious side, um, and it does very much split from during, during the season and, and out of season work. I mean, especially with the fact, you know, I can't believe, I, like I said, 2004 was when you started racing. You managed to get out uh, last year for a one-off uh, one return to Brit Car, which is one of the other championships that you've been. You've also done the Clio Cup uh, road and race series. Uh, you also if I remember correctly, won uh, the, won the you became a, a production car, touring cl car class B champion uh, in a, of all things, folks, a Fiat Abart 500, uh, which is also another thing. Along with that, you, you took the, the first ever win in the inaugural Smart 4-2 um, Cup at Doddington Park. So you've got some nice little accolades to add on to your CV. But having that two decades worth of driver experience, having gone through the rigmarole of signing up, settling things with, with teams that you're working with, of course, you've got a very big affiliation that you and I both know that with Westbourne Motorsport for a past few years as well. Uh, some great people there that have raced for the team over the past few years. Having that insight as a driver really does give you, I think in some respects, an advantage to be able to parlay that into the legalities of motorsport, having gone through the ring yourself, like saying, okay, right, I've got a 45 page 
sporting document reg regulation set that I've got to go through before the first, you know, before even testing. Um, having that does really sort of give you that unique insight, doesn't it? Because you can sort of like read between the lines a bit, a little bit, like saying, well, hang on a second. He said that, but looking at it between the lines, I see there's a little bit that could be uncovered here. So there's a bit of detective work as, as a legal advisor through motorsport legal through your company, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it is because you, you and I know when you're in the, the, the motorsport world, things happen and things are different. And having that understanding of what actually happens at a race weekend, how things are done, um, it, it really helps. It helps you with the language, obviously, because you're not going to a lawyer who doesn't understand circuit racing or rallying or autocross or whatever it may be. And they just have no comprehension of it. So they're looking at it purely legally. Whereas I can look at it actually from a sporting perspective as well. And I found that that really helps with when I'm in court as well. So actually representing clients, because mm -hmm. often I have to show footage and I have to explain what's going on um, and my interpretation of it. So having that knowledge of how a car works as well. So you'll have a collision and you'll say, well, OK, they actually did the best thing they could do. If they'd have come off the throttle, they'd have actually hit the guy next to them. Or, you know, just understanding how cars work and how races work does definitely help with representing clients without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, also, um, I've met not just yourself, but also your, your hubby, Adrian, uh, as well, who you've been with for quite a long time now. And you're a big Dachshund uh, lover as well, including with... Uh, still remember you posting on social media about Milo and now Ben's uh, part of the family as well. Um, uh, having a supportive so like support network uh, in any sort of form of work, it, whether it be the fact of you saying to Adrian, yeah, I want to go racing again. I've got, I've got that itch. I need to scratch it. What does he say to you normally when you just go, yeah, I think it's time to dust off the old race overalls again and, uh, and get out there and have a bit of fun. What, because he's normally quite, he's very supportive of you, isn't he, Adrian? Yeah, he just looks at the bank balance and goes, oh, God, not again. <laughs> <laughs> typical, you know, typical. Yeah. I mean, he, he's big into photography as well. So he, he comes in and you know, does, does photographs um, and makes sure I'm in the right place at the right time and, and just organises me. So, no, he's he's been great. He's really supportive um, and has been all the way through. In fact, he had a race licence before me. Um, really? But because of his... Yes, yeah, and I, and I don't know if you personally know Alex, but obviously he had health problems, mm -hmm. um, and he's got a compromised immune system and and has weekly treatments and things like that. So basically, he couldn't he couldn't afford to be bashed around in a car because of his health. So I then got a race license, and I'm the one. Race. So I think he's almost breaking through me as well in some respects. But yeah, um, he's a very good carter. Um, he's done some some carting. Yeah, brilliant. But I was the one that ended up doing it. It's funny how things work out that one person's unfor uh, misfortune becomes an opportunity for somebody else. But uh, as you said, Adrian vicariously living through your exploits. Now, I also wanted to get on to your role because you're on the committee with the British Women Racing uh, Drivers Club, where you also look after things legal from that perspective. You edit the magazine Racing Vogue as well. Uh, I mean, to be a part of that, we do see uh, quite a lot of drivers uh you know who are really sort of being trailblazers i mean i'll take for instance one particular driver such as jess hawkins being the first driver since susie wolf to get behind a formula one car and it was i was i was very very happy for jess because we we don't see enough women racers getting the opportunities that because we all know that motorsport is a male dominant well, from from up in the management side of things, but clubs such as the B, BW, uh, RDC do a fantastic job of promoting such great young talents. And, and we're seeing them all like come through the woodwork now and with F1 Academy uh, now starting to really push uh, not only women drivers, but also the fact that the Formula One teams are now backing the drivers on the F1 Academy grid for, for 2024, which I think is is a step forward, but we still have quite a long way to do to go, don't we? Yeah, I mean, I actually stepped back from the, the BWRDC committee um, a, a little while back, just because of time constraints, yeah. but I'm still very much involved with it and support the BWRDC. 
um, and have been. I mean, I was on the committee for, I think, about 15 years. So um, it's funny when you on Facebook, you get the memories. I, I you know, obviously auto sports just been quite recently and mm-hmm. uh, the Gold Star um, presentations used to be at the auto sports show. Yeah. And one memory that came up was with Jess when she was one of the nominees and she's about this high. <laughs> um, where, you know, where she's come now is is great. But no, you, you're right. I mean, I think license female license holders have gone up a little bit. Um, I think there are about 7% of the license holders now are are female. And there's obviously lots of things out there trying to get them into karting and trying to sort of promote them. But it, it, it's a numbers game. It's, it's always going to be a numbers game. And, you know, a lot of people always ask me about why aren't there more women, you know, in, in motorsport. And mm-hmm. one of my answers is a lot of girls are just not interested in motorsport. You know, that's the reality of it. And yep. so... Getting the ones that do, I mean, having people that they can see actually doing it, like Jess, um, is, I think, great. Because then, you know, you get these little girls that think, oh, actually, I could do that. Let's let's have a go. And the more we get that, the more we get the carters coming through, and there are you know quite a lot of good, good carters coming through now, then more and more will go to the next level and the next level. And, and you know, you will end up with, I absolutely believe we'll have a, a female in Formula One, but I think it's going to take some time. Yeah, I think that's the the biggest thing because, you know, I remember being at the 2014 British Grand Prix when Susie uh, Wolf at that point, well, that was after she got married to Toto because for those people that don't remember, Susie Wolf actually was racing in DTM uh, with Mercedes-Benz. And at that time, she was known as Susie Stoddart. And she's also raced against some of the current Formula One grid as well. Uh, you know, so... At the end of the day, there is still an opportunity for uh, drivers such as Jess, such as Abby Eaton, such as Charlie Martin. Uh, there's so many great drivers. Abby Pulling, one of the latest British crop to come through. Uh, Alicia Palmowski as well, who also uh, has, has been doing really, really well. She's been in Janetta Juniors last year. There are so many talents out there, folks, irrespective of whether they're male or female, get behind them. That's all I can say, because we need to we're seeing a lot more women getting involved behind the scenes with a lot of, like, say, social media and PR, which has been a long, long standing tradition. Um, you know, there are so many people that have done so much uh, in this business, but now we're seeing engineers. I mean, Ruth Bunscombe, a perfect example. Uh, Hannah, Hannah Schmitz at Red Bull Racing, another perfect example that. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the driving, but like you say, 7%, that's quite a worrying sort of percentile range. But we are seeing that these younger drivers are are really sort of showcasing what they're capable of. I mean, Dorian Pin now signed, is now on the Mercedes Studio program, formerly an Iron Dame. And then you've got the likes of Michelle Gatting, Sarah Bovey, uh, Rahul Fry, Catherine Legg, Tatiana Calderon, uh, who are racing this weekend at the Daytona 24 Hours, folks. At the Daytona 24, and they've got there through hard work, sheer determination. I still remember Tatiana when she was in European F3 alongside Verstappen, Ocon, Felix Rosenquist, and still did pretty well uh, considering the caliber of the field. But we're also seeing, Sarah, that a lot more women are getting interested in motorsport through social media. And it's not just people posting about which drivers they're supporting, which races they're going to. We're seeing a lot more content creators who are women. Ash Vandele being one of the biggest trailblazers over from the United States. Um, she's worked with SRO Americas last year. Um, she's also working with uh, Red Bull Sim Racing, so their sim racing arm. It's really good to see that there are a lot, a lot more women getting involved in front-facing and telling people and educating people in the right way in what motorsport is and making sure it's easy, digestible and quick to follow content, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. It's, it's, it's visibility. It's showing these youngsters coming up that, look, somebody can do it, that it's, it's, it's achievable. And when you've seen that somebody's done it already, it makes it so much easier for the ones that follow. You know, that you've got the, the trailblazers that are breaking those glass ceilings and making sure that, we can do it and make and it's been hard work it's been really hard work it's been years and years i mean i remember i mean susie we mentioned about the leader of the rdc you know susie was was um, a member of the club for many years and 
I know when I first started, when I was in the G20, um, Susie was doing Formula Renault, I think it was, and we were both at Donington, and, and it was a big thing that there was two girls racing that weekend, and, we, and the local press came down and did some pictures and stuff like that. And it's just like to see where she's now gone is is quite, and, and so many others that have followed from that. But that's like 20 years ago, you know, and it's it's still it's still hard work. But the more and more we're getting people in top positions that have that visibility and social media makes it so much easier because it's, you know, you can just pick up your phone and you can see what's going on. Um, and it is short snippets. So you can, oh, let's follow that person and see what they're doing. And it, that's all about visibility. And once you can see it, you can achieve it. Yeah, I've met so many great women, including yourself within paddocks, uh, not just domestically here in the United Kingdom, but internationally. Uh, Naomi Panter, who used to work actually for Behindra, Formula E. Uh, I actually met her back in 2016. She now is part of the directors of uh, Navigate Partners, which also is still very much involved in motorsport. You see so many great people now coming into this. And I think the the stereotypical uh, gender association with roles associated for women, I think, as I said, we still got that work to do, but there are so many that are just breaking that mold and going, look, I love motorsports just as anybody. Unfortunately, social media, we both know Sarah, can be at times a very, very toxic place. And especially, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot more fans come on to, let's say, 4B to 1 with Drive to Survive, which season six is about to hit Netflix very, very shortly. There's a lot more toxicity when it comes to 4B to 1. Either you're in the Hamilton camp, you're in the Verstappen camp, you're in the Sainz camp, Leclerc camp. It doesn't really matter. Social media, I remember, like, say, five or six years ago, before Drive to Survive came along, was a very, very peaceful and very, very opinionated but non-aggressive opinionated place. And now we have a very, very different side to that story. Yeah, and I think that's also why helping the youngsters coming up is really important, to be able to not take any of that to heart. You are always going to get... Um, you know, people making comments of well, she's not good enough and she's only there because she's a woman. I've had that as, as a lawyer. I've had, you know, somebody say, oh, she only won that case because she's a woman. Yeah, it's so you've got to be able to just deal with that and just say, do you know what? That's their problem, not mine. And I think the very fact that we've got a lot of, of um, women in the um, PR and social media circles is really helpful as well because they can support and help these young drivers, as, you know, when they're part of a team to. You, to some respects they've got to be shielded against post what you like just don't look at the comments you know have somebody separate look at the comments and, and yeah. deal with them if they need to be um because i, I think it's just it, it's just that negativity you say it's to toxic and you are always going to get that now and i think it does sort of depend on what platforms you're looking at as well because I, I, for me certainly my view is there's some that are certainly more toxic than others and there's others that i i avoid like plague and there's ones that i think oh, actually you know, that, that works okay so, um, and again, experience is it's experience and having that um, for the youngsters to say, oh, what, what's the best thing to do? Have some guidance, um, which is what they really need. So they're not coming at it completely, completely fresh. Yeah, I think the the one that really I see the, the, the biggest amount of toxicity on is actually on X or Twitter. I still call it Twitter. I don't care what Elon, Elon yeah. Musk has rebranded it to. It's just that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> It, it, you know, Facebook is, is a great place to, to publicize stuff. Instagram, I find very, very good. LinkedIn, uh, you know, because sometimes people want to know what you're doing. And it's like with this podcast, I always try and promote it as much as I can. But you only you only get what you put in by sort of publicizing it. And I think also um, I'm always of the opinion, Sarah, that sometimes I could put something on social media and I could get absolutely lambasted or I might get a few people that would actually agree with my opinion. But the thing is with socials is that like we're having a conversation, we can read each other's body language. We, we can tell what the tone of the conversation is like, but on socials, it is everyone behind one of these. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and words can be read completely differently if you don't know what the tone is behind them. Um, I mean, I, I have to be really careful as well, because obviously with the job that I do, there is always some, you know, we spoke about the recent case, you know, if I win a case, my client's delighted, 
but there's a loser in inverted commas you know there's somebody that's um possibly lost a championship because of the, the result so you're always and, and obviously i'm the focus of that i'm i'm the one that's caused that i'm the baddie so i always you know i have to be, be fairly strong and just think yeah whatever it's going to happen um and i mentioned earlier about you know i i get um hate if you like um about the fact that why does drivers need need a lawyer it must be because they they want to cheat and that as i've explained earlier that's not the case it's yeah. a case of putting yourself in the best position possible so you don't have to worry about all of the regulations because i do that for you um but yeah so social media has, has not been kind to me in some respects as well but you just have to brush it up and just say you know what it's, it's their problem not mine yeah exactly i so try to keep personal and, and work separate as well um mm. because obviously you have your personal pages which are your friends and you know and again you, you get some comments that might have been you know you've known for a few years that you've not necessarily interacted with um but try to keep them separate so that you have your personal and you have your work so sarah we talked about the toxicity of social media but let's get on to another aspect that you're also involved in with regards to assisting drivers, assisting teams when it comes to motorsport social media. Now, we know that social media is a very, very big player. We've already talked about that through about content creation, uh, people sort of making their their own respective inroads. How important for you when you were driving, like in, you know, like for a full season campaign, how how important was that in terms of re return on investment for sponsors and, and getting fan activation and that kind of thing? Um, in, in your honest opinion, it's become a, uh, the be all or end all. You know, we see TikTok, we see Twitch, we see YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. There's a lot of platforms that people use. Um, how important was it for when you were you were racing to get the ROI with regards to sponsors that had activated and went, yeah, we want to back you for this season? Well, I think it actually goes beyond, but you're before that when you're trying to get sponsors, because, um, and this is something I do help advise drivers on, is their proposals, because um, I get a lot of particularly young drivers who send, obviously, um, material to me saying, I'm brilliant, I'm going to win, give me money. And as a business, that that doesn't do the job. That's not what it's about. Um, as you say, it's, it's about return on investment. So it's making sure that um, they're thinking about the businesses they're approaching and what they're going to get from it. And every business is, this is what I try to explain to people, every business is different. So there's some businesses that just want a sticker on the car. They want that visibility. There are some um, businesses that want hospitality. They want to be able to go to races or take their clients or employees. Um, and there are some that actually want the networking. So every business wants something different out of sponsorship. And um, I don't, I mean, I generally say I don't like to call it sponsorship. I call it strategic partnership because it is a business partnership. Mm -hmm. So I always say to, to, to drivers, throw that away, start again, think about actually, by all means, say how great your history is, but you don't go into a lot of detail because I don't care. I don't care if you win or if you're fifth if I'm getting what I want out of it. Mm -hmm. So and it's that mindset that I think a lot of young drivers don't have. I mean, speaking for me personally, I, as you probably know, I, I um, sponsor Aaron Taylor Smith in the touring cars. And I chose Aaron over anybody else because he absolutely gets it. He understands you know, that getting to the bottom of what you need as a business is the important thing and delivering on that. So it starts right at the beginning and then you've got to work through the year and make sure that they're getting that. And that can be, and say it could be social media, but it's not always. So um, a lot of people obviously want social media content, but it, and that is a, you know, a big thing and it is important, but not every sponsor wants that. They, a lot of bigger sponsors may have their own PR and social media departments anyway, so they'll get that covered. They don't care about you doing that as a, as a driver. Um, so it's 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 about tailoring it to the you know to the individual um, business that you're approaching, and that was the same for me. You know, I, I had several sponsors um, over the years that I was driving full seasons, and every every one of them wanted something different. Yeah, I mean, especially with the fact that live streaming, apart from like say subscription services, 
The good thing is, obviously, Aaron Taylor-Smith, currently one of the uh, Powermarks guys, along with the likes of Andrew Watson, Jack Sears Trophy, Jack Sears Trophy winner from last year, uh, who uh, f- came back to front-wheel drive for the first time since, I think it was 2015, and did a great job for, for the crew there. But yeah, Aaron completely gets it. And it, and also the fact is is that you've got to be a bit of a personality in motorsport, and Aaron is definitely that. He, came, he, he, he went to sports cars for a couple of years, came back, with a renewed vigor and, and he's still, he's still one of those personalities that is just, he's always smiling, you know, no matter what situation might be happening, he's very happy go lucky, isn't he? When you see him in a paddock and he's like, Oh, it's a race weekend. But also he knows that there's a lot of hard work that he's not just doing, as you said, with regards to the team, the mechanics, the engineers, but it's also providing that tailor made experience for whichever sponsors that he's got on board, which includes motorsport legal, but that's where you've really got to perform. And especially with the, you know, you look at for folks, if you want to look up the, the, the ITV sport coverage um, in terms of how much traction it gets, not just on social media, but then when you've got, the, you know, the two main voices of the British, you know, the, the main voices of the British touring car championship, including the legend that is Steve Ryder, David Addison has been there for so many years Tim Harvey, he's raced there. He knows the whole rigmarole with regards to being a British Touring Car Championship driver. He's won championships himself. He even, in the last decade, has come back for the odd occasional run in a Porsche Super Cup. So it just goes to show that even commentators who are ex-drivers still want to scratch that itch. So, But I think also um, by having that return on investment, that activation directly with that tailor-made experience can also help that relationship to flourish if it's like the first year and they're like saying well this is what they're wanting and that driver then goes well hang on a second surprise them halfway through the season and say you know what you fancy coming to the last round of the championship you said you didn't want to come to any rounds but but we'll make sure this is sorted this is sorted they always see that when drivers go that little bit of an extra mile to help keep that relationship going that makes the difference by retaining or losing a sponsor going into the following 12 months. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Aaron is a great example because he's got people who've been with him for 10 years um, because it's obviously easier to keep a sponsor than have to go and find another one. So, you know, if you just spend that bit of time during the season and, and Aaron checks in all the time. And the other great thing is he's open to suggestions as well. So he'll say, you know, Okay, we agreed to do this at the beginning of the year. Is it working? Do we need to do something different? You know, make some suggestions. So it's it's a moving body, if you like. It's a moving animal um, that you need to, to to check in and make sure that that's working. Because then people will stay with you and they will increase the amount that they're perhaps putting into you. And um, yeah, that's just a lot easier than starting from scratch with somebody you know you've only just approached. I mean. I really want to ask one more one more question, Sarah, before we uh, sort of call time on on episode fifty three. And thank you for uh, for coming along and and joining me. And, and obviously, great to get the legal uh, insights as well through your experience through through most sport legal and Sarah Franklin solicitors. Um, what has been the 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 biggest sort of like highlights of of your career apart from you know becoming a a, a champion in a, a theatre bath and and then also becoming the inaugural smart four to uh cup uh, cup race winner at, at donnington park Are there re- any sort of real moments that stand out to you it doesn't have to necessarily be a win or a championship title what sticks out to you most in your mind oh, gosh i'm racing rather than legal um yes i mean i have to say i think that the the, the, the win in the smart four two at donnington was was the, was the biggie for me because you know it was it was up against some really good drivers um we we're all it was all very even because none of us had been in the car before and it was my favorite track which is Donington which I absolutely love so that that was really good um I think some sometimes just the drives that you've done I mean I've I've, the Clio when I did the I moved up from the road series to the the Clio Cup just for me it was all about improving it was all about getting better every time Mm. and um I felt that in the Clio Cup I, I clicked with the with the Gen 3 um, and absolutely loved driving it. So I was gutted when they, they pulled the plug on it. Um, obviously, there's a new Clio Cup this year in the Gen 5. Watch this space, is all mm-hmm. I say. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, it, I, I did, I've always loved, and I love working with, with Westbourne. They've always been a great team. They're very supportive. Ed Pete's been a great driver coach. 
and, and James Colvin sort of coaches me as well. So yeah, it's it's that's probably the driving the Clio more than anything. Go the old Gen Three, the old shoulder snapper, as one of my friends used to refer it to, because it was a very very hearty sequential gearbox on the right hand side of the steering wheel, if I remember correctly, before they went to paddle shifts for the Gen Four. But Sarah, thank you so much for being. Uh, our guest on episode 53 of commentators corner folks please don't forget uh, if you want to like share and subscribe it's at your leisure i'm not going to force anybody i just say it as a rudimentary side of things uh, all the links that will be in the description for uh, any website so say motorsport legal uh, i'll also maybe throw in a couple of your social medias in there as well sarah from the racing side uh, but thank you very much for being on the show thanks for having me well, folks, as I always like to close out, if in doubt, flat out. We'll see you very soon for episode number 54 coming soon.